Video games have a wide range of genres and systems that define those genres. Players have struggled with or not completely understood combat mechanics in games. Let's change that. Let's build a deck. Tales of Arise is an action combat JRPG released on September 9th, 2021. Available for PlayStation 4, PlayStation 5, Xbox One, Xbox Series X, Xbox Series S, and Windows. And there will be no story spoilers. I'll be going over all combat mechanics, stats, anything that alters stats, and items. Feel free to use the timestamps to skip to specific information you're looking for, but I suggest watching everything as there may be small details you are not aware of. Let me give you a quick look at what we'll be going over. Combat example, please. I played on PlayStation 5, so all controls will be PlayStation oriented. Before we get started, know the controls can be rebound. Now let's get to some of those buttons you just saw. R1 is for basic attacks. Basic attacks can also be performed in the air. And circle for jump. R2 for dodge. In the bottom right corner is the art attacks for the active character. There are three while on the ground and three while in the air. Press the corresponding button to use each art attack. Underneath the active character you can see their health bar, but more importantly, their current AG, which are the blue diamonds. Every time the character uses an art, it consumes these diamonds and they refresh over time. Underneath the HP bar will also be any buffs or debuffs the character currently has. When performing hits in quick succession, you create a combo and the combo counter is in the top right of the screen, displaying how many hits are in the combo and the amount of damage done. To switch targets during combat, hold L1, then move the left stick to change targets. The current enemy's level, name, health bar, element, and type are located on the top left of the screen. You can also just switch to the nearest target by just pressing L1. There are three ways to switch the active character. Hold L1 and press the corresponding D-pad button. The red flag will switch to a different portrait, and you may notice that the camera is shifting. The camera changes according to what enemy is being targeted by the active character. Press the touchpad, then press L1 or R1. You can see the character switch on the right side of the screen. Or select Edit and press Square on a portrait to change leader. In this window, you can also switch the out of combat characters into the current party. Press X on a battle member, and then press X on a support member. And do you see these arrows? We're going to be seeing these again in a moment. The other method to switch in out of combat characters is to hold L2, then hold the D-pad button for a character. You'll see these arrows again over the portrait. And then hold the D-pad button for someone in the party, and it will switch these characters. The only downside to this method is it will use the boost attack for the character switching in if it is available. This one's mine. Speaking of boost attacks, this white outline indicates a boost attack is ready for use. Press the corresponding button on the D-pad to activate that character's boost attack. Press L2 to access the out of combat characters to use their boost attacks. 
Boost attacks also refill 3 AG for the active character. Now on the middle right side of the screen is the party's health bars and cure points, or CP. CP is used for healing or buff arts. Buffs and debuffs can be seen under the health bars here as well. Now that the basics are out of the way, let's go back over each of these with more detailed information. I'll be going over everything combat, including anything that alters character stats. Arts are the basis of the party's damage. The art screen can be reached via the menu. Press the touchpad during or outside of combat and select arts. There are three slots for ground attacks and three slots for aerial attacks. Some arts have an up arrow and a down arrow. All up arrows will be under ground attack and these arts will lift the character into the air with an attack and can lift some enemies into the air as well. All down arrows will be under aerial attack which sends the character to the ground while performing an attack instead of just falling back down naturally. Just below the art windows, there's a description of what the art does, and some arts even have an associated element or have unique traits based on the character. Elements and character traits will be discussed later. Next to ground attack, it shows AG, then a number. That is how many AG it costs to use this art. Arts that heal or increase stats will cost CP, and that will be displayed here. Next to AG is the symbol for the element of the art if it has one, such as Eternal Devastation. To the right of the art name, it says Count. This is a counter for how many times the art has been used in combat, and once a milestone is reached, it adds a star, which increases the strength of the art. Once Eternal Devastation has been used 100 times, it will gain a star. At the top of the screen, press L1 or R1 to cycle between the different characters. The order they are displayed in is based on where they are in the party formation, so they may not always be in the same order. This L2, R2 thing? We'll, we'll, we'll talk about that later. A bit into the game, you will also unlock another set of settable arts, doubling the usable arts per character to 12. A quick showcase of the different types of arts. Physical hits, Mega Sonic Thrust. Physical hit that counts as an element, Eternal Devastation. It is Earth, by the way. Astral Art or Magic, Burning Strike. Astral Arts have a cast time, and there are ways to manipulate this cast time. I will speak on the cast time manipulation later. There are three ways to cancel an Astral Art. Jump. Dodge. Boost Attack. After an Astral Art has been cast, you are stuck in an animation and cannot move. But most of this can also be cancelled by a jump, dodge, or boost attack. Boost attack being the strongest option as it will cancel anything immediately, and I mean anything. Heal. Here, let me help. First aid. First. It heals HP. Buff. Steal. Raises damage for a period. Up arrow attack. Rising wyvern. Down arrow attack. Mirage. Note there are arts that are a string of attacks. This string of attacks cannot be interrupted except by getting hit by an enemy or a boost attack. Dodging won't work either, so be careful with what buttons you press and what arts you choose to use. Now having said that, aerial arts are different. Parts of aerial arts can be interrupted with another action. Law's Fang Bolero, for example, has four hits, but if an action is performed after the third hit, the fourth hit is interrupted. One last bit of art information. These squares around art symbols indicate tiers. In Rinwell's case, Spread is the base art, Freeze Lancer is one tier above it, and Tidal Wave is the final tier for that set of arts. The tiers often indicate the order the arts can be learned in, and their initial strength. Each character in the party has their own unique boost attack. This mechanic brings in some new keywords that will also be mentioned in the future. Alphans boost attack will down most enemies. Most. When an enemy is downed, it lays on the ground for a few seconds, and you gain some bonuses. Extra damage, the enemy will not move, they will not attack you, and your combo counter will not reset. Notice when Alphan's boost attack hits the enemy, it says boost break in blue. This means you used a boost attack on an appropriate enemy and downed them. Alphan's boost attack has no limit to how many times an enemy can be downed when hit with it. His boost attack also counts as the fire element. Xion's boost attack will down flying enemies and has long range. Enemies with this symbol next to their name are classified as flying enemies. 
Once you have performed a boost break on an enemy with one of these symbols, the symbol will then have a red circle over it, and using the boost attack again will not activate a boost break or down the enemy again for that battle. Runewell's boost attack will interrupt enemies casting arts and stop them. If an art is interrupted, the enemy will be downed and Runewell will steal the art that was being cast and store it in her book. Specifics on art storing later. If multiple enemies that cast different spells are casting, it is random which spell Renwell will steal. I could not find a way to control which spell is stolen. I tried being closer in proximity to an enemy, targeting a specific enemy with the boost attack, having an enemy be the first to start casting their spell, and combinations of all of these. I determined it is random. Renwell's boost attack also has a symbol, but it is only active while the enemy is downed. Once it is able to move again, it goes away. I don't know why this exists since Runwell's boost attack only works while an enemy is casting, so of course hitting it with a boost attack again would not work in this situation. Runwell's boost attack has no limit for how many times it can down an enemy, and Runwell will hit each enemy on the battlefield with her boost attack, so you can down multiple enemies as well. Law's boost attack is used to down enemies that have a shield. Shield enemies have this symbol next to their name, and like Xion's boost attack, the shield symbol will have a red circle over it once you boost break. Using the boost attack again will not activate a boost break or down the enemy again for that battle. Kisara's boost attack is used to down charging enemies. A charging enemy is often one that has this red aura as it is barreling towards you or simply just, you know, charging. Oh, but they do have a symbol. It's only visible as they are charging. And there is a red version of it as well, but... There is no limit to downing enemies with Kisara's boost attack. Dohulim's boost attack is used to boost break fleet of foot or evasive enemies. You can tell if the enemy is fleet of foot if it has this symbol next to its name. Once you perform a boost break, the symbol will also have the red circle, so you cannot do it again during that battle. Each character has voice lines to help you remember that they can perform boost breaks on an enemy in the current battle. Here's a couple of examples. A quick note, in each of the boost attack clips, the boost attack was performed from the perspective of the active character. You do not have to be in control of a character to use their boost attack, and there are a few interesting ways of using this. No matter where the character is on the battlefield, they will warp to whatever enemy you are targeting when you use their boost attack. Whether they are on the ground, in the air, they'll get there for you. Also, a character using a boost attack is invulnerable. They will not take damage while the animation plays. Boost attack meter. As I said earlier, a boost attack is ready for a character when their portrait has a white outline. When the character does not have their boost attack up, there is a meter that helps you know when the boost attack will become available. It is the bottom right side of the character portrait. It will fill with a white bar from bottom to the right corner. This meter fills naturally over time by landing attacks and landing counter edges on enemies. New turns just don't stop showing up. Before we go into counter edges, we got more boost stuff. Boost strikes. They are flashy ways of insta-killing enemies. You will hear this sound. See strike on the enemy and see all character portraits glowing blue when a boost strike is ready. Press a d-pad button to select a character for a boost strike and they will perform a finishing team attack with another party member at random. Yes, there are boost strikes for every combination of the party, and I will not show them all. Go play the game. Note, boost strikes have the potential to hit multiple enemies on the battlefield, and they have an element. They count as area of effect hits. There are a few unique boost strikes, so look out for those. They are unique to specific situations. You'll notice them. You can also see when a boost strike is going to be available. Boost attack, boost attack meter, boost break, boost strike, and now boost strike meter. While comboing enemies, combo details later, look at this square trying to disguise itself with a 45 degree rotation. Starting from the top, there is a blue meter that begins to fill the square. Once it fills all the way, a boost strike becomes available. Pay attention to this meter. When it starts to fill, how much combo it takes to fill, and will it fill, varies for different enemies. A couple of notes. Generally, the boost strike meter fills quicker when the enemy has low HP. Boost attacks can knock down enemies even after the initial boost break and will get up much faster. Boost strikes do not one-hit kill bosses, but be sure you perform your boost strike on them when you can. 
their health bars will not continue to lower until the boost strike happens. That is it for the boost family. Next. Time for counter edge. These are tied to the dodging mechanic. R2 lets you dodge, but dodging just before you get hit and then pressing R1, the normal attack button, will activate a counter edge. It is a follow up to the perfect dodge that lets you get in a free hit and begin a combo. You will also gain the ability to perform counter edges upon defeating enemies. And this allows you to teleport from enemy to enemy, and it feels great. Both are unlocked early in the game. You do, however, have to unlock the counter edge ability for each character. The unlock conditions for counter edge and counter edge upon enemy defeat can be found in the arts slash skill panel spreadsheet in the video description. Counter edges can sometimes place you in the air, so be ready to perform your aerial combos. I know you've been practicing. Let me take a moment to point out there are two types of dodges. The first is directional. You hold the stick in a direction and dodge. The second is a neutral dodge. Do not move the stick, then dodge. This performs a back dodge, and some characters do have a different animation for this. That back dodge helped me get counter edges on some attacks way easier, but at times, dodging into an attack is better. Try them out and see which works better for you. Oh, and you can do some nutty and unexpected things with counter edges. Check this out. Enemies with area of effect attacks and multi-hit attacks garner you multiple perfect dodges, equaling more counter edges. The area of effect attacks have damage ticks, where you take damage at set intervals depending on the attack, and you can perfect evade each tick. Essentially, you're standing in an AoE and taking zero damage. But know some attacks only hit once, even if it looks like it hits multiple times. I love doing this. Weak points. They're enemies that have huge orange crystals growing on them. These can also be targeted, and when they are destroyed, the enemy will be downed. Pay attention as these spots can sometimes grow back. Overlimit. This mode activates by a character taking damage and executing perfect dodges. You know when you go into Overlimit when the camera zooms in and the character glows blue, like this. In Overlimit, arts no longer cost AG and enemies will not interrupt the character's attacks. Foes you come across can enter Overlimit as well and can no longer be downed while in this state. Overlimit lasts for a certain period. How long it lasts for a character in your party is denoted by this blue bar. Once the bar is emptied, Overlimit will end. A character does not have to be the active character for Overlimit to activate either. When a character is on the cusp of gaining Overlimit, they have this blue, glowy mist. Mystic Arts. These are powerful arts that each character in the party can use. To activate a Mystic Art, the character has to be in Overlimit. Then hold two art attack buttons after landing an art attack. If you use a multi-hitting art, at least one of the hits must connect with the enemy. Note the Mystic Art after it finishes will place the targeted enemy in the center of the battlefield. Use this for some cheeky repositioning or switch targets for the Mystic Art to get an enemy away from another party member. Also note Mystic Arts do have an element. Later in the game, characters can earn a second Mystic Art. To perform these, it is the same as the original Mystic Art with the added condition of performing five different arts consecutively. And with Overlimit, you of course do not have to worry about having these arts interrupted. No, I missed Stardust, my combo broke! Just kidding, it still works. These Mystic Arts are unlocked by attaining max affinity with each character, except for Alphans, which you will unlock via the story. When at a campfire, you can choose to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with a member of the party. Once each unique speech bubble conversation is done for a character, their second Mystic Art will unlock. Now there will be a smiley face icon to solidify the bonds that have been created. Combos are just landing multiple attacks on an enemy with no pauses in between. But there are a few details that will add more to your combo game. First, let's look at basic attacks again. The combo counter goes up, but take a closer look. This thing is still performing actions and even attacking me, stopping my combo. The true combo starter in Tales of Arise is getting break status, also known as staggering. After landing enough hits on an enemy, you will see break in gold letters. Once this happens, the enemy's feet will leave the ground, meaning you can juggle them with each subsequent attack with no retaliation from them, until you run out of basic attacks. AG, use attacks that don't combo well together, so you miss, or you get hit by a different enemy. AG begins to auto-refill a moment after a character is done attacking. If you use an attack before the AG begins to refill, it will stay at the current amount. Using an art attack will always reset the refill period. If you use a basic attack while the AG is refilling, it will not halt the refill. Fit in pauses in your combos and use basic attacks for filler while your AG fills up. 
It is also possible to buffer an art attack while one is already happening. After you begin an art attack, press the button for the next attack before the current one ends, and the second attack will begin once the first one has ended. There is no need to time the next attack with the final hit of the first. If you buffered the wrong attack, no worries. Just press a new button and it will overwrite the last button you pressed. The game will always use the most recently pressed button. Also, when I watch people play this game, I notice a lot of people avoiding aerial combos. Please do aerial combos, because when you're in the air, you don't get hit by ground-based attacks. Also, I really loved air combos. Be sure to test and experiment with different arts. Characters learn to understand what combos well, or to just find a new favorite attack. Oh, I almost forgot. Astral arts have reduced cast time if used in the middle of combos. Have fun with that, you magic lovers. Here are a few early game combos to get you started. Don't forget boost attacks can extend combos, not just for the extra hit, but 3 AG gain when a boost attack is used. Some enemies are heavier and harder to combo in the air, so no aerial basic attacks here. I also gained an extra AG due to landing a crit in this combo so I could afford Death Blossom. Renwell can charge spells in her book to cast spells she has not learned yet. Character-specific traits are coming up soon. I do not think you can just use the same arts over and over in your combos. Well, you can, but they are diminishing returns. If the same move is used within 4 actions, it begins to stagger the enemy for less time until the enemy is not being juggled anymore and the combo counter resets. More specifically, the character's penetration stat is lowered. It'll be a bit before we get to character stats. Add a little spice to your combos to keep them functional. It is time for character traits. Each character has their own unique aspects, other than their boost attack and arts. Alfin's unique trait has to do with his fire sword. To explain this, we will have to take a look at his arts window again. This is where Flaming Edge and his arts description comes into play. If you use Rising Wyvern and hold the art button, it will activate Alfin's Flaming Edge Rising Phoenix. If the text for the Flaming Edge is gray, you have not unlocked it yet. Flaming Edge attacks consume some of Alfin's HP. You can't wield a sword that is constantly on fire for free. Have you seen his gloves? He will also gain the ability to make his Flaming Edges do more damage by consuming his HP. Alvin has a few different Flaming Edge arts, so be sure to check which ones are on which arts. These abilities are unlocked via the skill panel, and I will go over the skill panel after character traits. Shion is one of the healers of the party, but this is not her unique trait. She shoots and has elemental grenades. Let's go over to her arts window. All of her grenade-based abilities will share this symbol to the left of the art name. Down below you will see Blast Sniper, and this also indicates it is a grenade-based art. These arts have two forms. If you press the art button, she throws a grenade and it explodes. If you press the art button and hold it, Shion will throw the grenade then shoot it, causing the grenade's effect to change. Now you can't throw grenades forever. Do you recognize this symbol? The number next to it is Shion's grenade ammo. Basic grenades can be used whenever, but for the hold version you need ammo. There are two ways to recover ammo. Press the basic attack button when you have hit 0, or reload whenever you want by holding L2 plus R1. Rinwell is not the only party member that casts elemental arts, but she is the only one that can store them and use them later. You can delay an art cast with any character by holding the art button. Once the cast is finished, just let go of the button when you're ready to unleash the magic. But in the hold state, press R1 with Rinwell, and she will store that cast in her book. The next attack performed will instant cast the spell that was stored. Rinwell does have one more trick up her sleeve. 
If you cast, store, and cast the same spell again, the spells will combine and create a higher tier spell. This allows Renwell to use spells she has not even learned yet. Renwell can store up to three spells in her book, allowing her to cast even higher tier magic. There is a spreadsheet in the video description detailing Renwell's spell combinations. You can combine spells of different elements too. A note, Runwell's book changes color based on the element of the spell stored. A nice touch. Law is a straightforward brawler and his trait emphasizes his strengths. Keep hitting foes while not getting staggered and Law's hands and feet will glow. This is his awakening state. In this state he gains increased attack and elemental attack. Not landing an attack after a period will cause you to lose awakening as well. Personally one of my favorites since I enjoy big numbers combined with the risk of losing out on damage if I don't play well enough. His utter flurry of blows helps too feels good. There's also potential for multiple levels of awakening for Law. Have fun maintaining it in combat though. Kisara is the only character that wields a shield, using it to defend instead of dodging. This can take some getting used to. To her arts window, Kisara has one more trait in that when she successfully blocks an attack, some of her arts become stronger and harder for enemies to block. This can be seen in the art description, stronger if activated while guarding. Guard an attack, then press the art button while still guarding to get this bonus. Her shield will now glow white and the bonus is active as long as that glow remains. It will dissipate when you stop attacking. Note, when Kisara equips a new shield, she does not switch out her mace. It is impressive how much of a shield collector slash lover she is, or is the mace the true heirloom? Dohalim is the party's other healer. His trait, do you enjoy perfect dodging? I certainly do, because it gives the player a nice advantage, but Dohalim gets an extra one. When he perfect dodges, his rod will glow on both ends, increasing his attack range and penetration. Character stats are coming up, but penetration lets Dohalim land critical hits more often and interrupt enemy actions better. This enhanced state will go away on its own over time. This man is by far the flashiest with his moves, coupled with the hardest moveset to string together for combos. At least for me. I would love to know if other players' success making combos work for him. We are done with the major information pertaining to combat. Let's get into menus, stats, equipment, etc. Skill panels can only be accessed outside of combat. Here, passive attributes can be purchased for each character, and new arts. Each of these circles are titles. Each title has six acquirable attributes. The one at the top, increased max AG in this case, is unlocked when you acquire the title. The rest of the nodes on the circle are unlocked by spending SP. SP is earned through combat. The combat results window shows how much EXP and SP you earned. The game even gives you a score for the encounter. Move the cursor over each one to see a full description of its effects. Once you acquire each node on this title, you get the completion bonus. If the cursor is hovered over the middle of the title, there is a description for it and the completion bonus. Hover over a title that you have not acquired to see the requirements to unlock it. There is a list of titles for each character, and what is available to purchase varies per character. Titles are unlocked by playing through the story, completing specific tasks such as side quests, or completing certain objectives. A list of all titles and arts for each character is in the video description. Let's take a moment to go over combat points. The better you perform in combat, the quicker you can level and strengthen your characters. After you win a battle, there is the result screen. Here you can see EXP and SP earned, score, and the time it took for you to win. The higher the score, the more SP and art proficiency you will receive. Your combat score is increased by defeating rare enemies, finish off enemies with mystic arts, use boost strikes, use boost attack, down enemies with boost attacks, do big combos, fighting multiple enemies, defeating enemies quickly. Your combat score will decrease by losing battle, characters being KO'd, using items, taking too much time to win. In other words, do good. Battle chain bonuses. Blow the minimap when you defeat a group of enemies in a diamond. A square, freaking square ninjas, appears and fills with a yellow bar. In the center is a number. This number can go up to four, and after four, it turns blue. This is your combat chain. The more combat points you receive, the quicker this meter fills. The meter depletes over time when not in combat. The higher this meter is, the more EXP you earn and higher drop rates for items. The higher the meter, the quicker it depletes as well. There are also rare foes tied to this meter. When it is blue, if you keep fighting enemies in a zone, there is a chance a big enemy will interrupt the fight. The Happy Bottle is an item that will increase the battle chain gauge. Don't forget about them like I did. You can do the damage, learn new arts, and gain bonuses. Let's get into the numbers that fuel each of them. Press the touchpad for the menu, and then L1 for the status window. 
We have HP, AG, each stat with its value, character level, EXP to next level, total EXP, art proficiency, equipment currently equipped, and accessory skills. Attack affects the damage of non-elemental attacks. Elemental attack affects the damage of elemental attacks. Note, mystic art damage is based on whichever of these stats is the highest. Penetration allows your character to land critical hits more often and more likely to interrupt enemies. Defense affects the damage taken from non-elemental attacks. Elemental defense affects damage taken from elemental attacks. Note, mystic art's damage from enemies is reduced based on which of these stats is the highest. Resistance makes your characters less likely to take critical hits and less likely to be interrupted when attacked. Leveling up will increase these stats. Art proficiency is an interesting one and something I barely paid attention to on my playthrough. Each character has three different proficiencies. These are based on what types of arts they use. The more you use sword strikes with Alfin, the higher this value goes. When a proficiency hits certain numbers, the character learns a new art. These new arts are learned during combat. Alfin learned Lightning Thrust. After reaching 100 Aerial Strike proficiency, use a Sword Strike art in the next encounter to learn the new art. In most instances, the art used to learn the new art will share the same proficiency. Equipment is just as it looks. Each character can be equipped with a weapon, armor, and an accessory. Accessory skill is a list of passive effects you have unlocked on your equipped accessory. Stats are important in RPGs, and sometimes can even change how you decide to engage in combat. There are six elemental affinities in the game. Fire, water, wind, earth, light, and dark. Attacking enemies with their same element will do reduced damage, denoted by resist displayed in blue, while using the opposite element will deal extra damage, weakness, and red. Here's the list of which elements oppose each other. If you use a fire art on a water enemy, you will do extra damage. Conversely, if you use a water art on a fire enemy, it will also do extra damage. This is what it means for the elements to oppose each other. Physical ailments are a status effect that can be inflicted on your character or enemies. When an attack that can deal a physical ailment lands, it has a chance to inflict that ailment. The more of these types of attacks that land, the higher the chance to inflict the ailment. The types of ailments are Poison, lose HP over time Paralysis, chance to flinch when performing an action, interrupting it Freeze, unable to move for a time here? Curse, raises damage received and lowers endurance Note, all ailments will reduce AG recovery speed by 50%, and any art that can inflict an ailment will have one of these symbols, along with its elemental symbol in its art description. Ailments can be healed via certain arts, items, or you can let it dissipate on its own over time. Items! Items can be used both in combat and out of combat. The in combat items menu will only consist of the restorative items. Gels restore HP or CP. Treats heal all party members for a set amount of HP. Panacea Bottles cures ailments, Life Bottles resurrects KO'd characters, and Elixirs full restore a character from KO and HP. When an item is used in combat, there is a cooldown before you can use an item again. This cooldown's length is dependent on the item used. The Out of Combat Items menu has more tabs. Some of them will be gone over, but not on this items page. Let's move over to the Equipment window, not the Weapon or Armor tabs here. The equipment window can be accessed in or out of combat. Here you can equip one of a weapon, armor, and accessory. The character stats window is here, and you can read descriptions for the equipped items. When equipping a different weapon, you can see how your stats will change. Blue meaning the item will be an increase, and red being a decrease in your character's current stats. Notice some weapons enhance a specific element. Feel free to equip more advantageous equipment mid-combat. Not something some RPGs allow you to do. You can craft both weapons and accessories in Tales of Arise through merchants. To craft a weapon requires monster drops and gold, the game's currency. That's it! It's always cool when games allow weapons to have a different physical appearance. Not every game does this. Creating accessories is going to require a bit more explanation. In the Create Accessory option, we have Craft Accessory and Enhance Accessory. To craft an accessory, you will need ore. There are many ore deposits throughout the game of varying types. Some ore can only be obtained in certain areas of the game. These are the ore gathering points. Under craft accessory, we have the list of accessories on the left, required materials next to that, a description of the accessory on the bottom, and current gold with the crafting cost of the accessory. There are accessories that can help with ailments, increase attack, reduce elemental damage, and so on. Let's go with the warrior emblem. It increases attack by 15%. This accessory is only made with Brymore ore, and I have 29 of them, but it only requires one. 
You can also press L1 and R1 to help filter what type of ore you're looking for. Attack, Defense, and Support. Once you select the accessory you want to make, we have a new window. It has a list of ores, and it shows us exactly what new skills it will come with. Each ore you gather will randomly generate these new skills. In our list of ores, notice they have a rank, and this number is also blue next to the ore icon. There's also a rank 2 and 1. Ranks go up to 5. The rank determines how many new skills an accessory comes with. Enhance accessories used to activate the new skills on your accessories. Did you think they would work on item creation? RPGs do not let you have it that easy. The accessory needs to be leveled to gain them. Let's select the warrior emblem I made. The ore I don't want will become fodder for my warrior emblem. Next to level 1, it shows 0 of 5. This is the total ranks worth of ores I must use to level it. It will take 5 rank 1 ores, or 2 rank 2s, and 1 rank 1 ore. You can even do 3 rank 2 ores. As long as the total is 5 or greater, you're good. Once the accessory is leveled, the level 2 new skill highlights. Now the skill will work in combat. Pressing L1 or R1 will let you switch between ores or already made accessories for fodder. Later in the game, you can even transfer accessory skills to another accessory, which will require more explanation. This feature is available further into the game. It does just as it sounds. You can transfer a skill from one accessory to another. But how you do that costs a fair amount of gall and a little bit of planning. Tip 1, gather lots of ores. It'll make this easier. Tip 2, you can only have as many skills as you do new skill slots. So lower rank accessories will have fewer skills. Tip 3, certain skills can only appear in certain new skill slots. Info for these skills in the video description. Let's craft a warrior emblem again. This is a rank 5 ore, so we have the full 4 new skill slots. But with one problem, I don't want any of these current bonuses. I want them all to be attack. But not just any attack. I want the highest attack value that I can achieve. The attack stat will appear in the level 2 and level 4 slots. The level 2 slot will be plus 20 attack, and the level 4 will be plus 60 attack. Therefore, I want all new skill slots on this warrior emblem to have attack plus 60. To do this, we will need 4 other accessories that have attack plus 60, and looky here. There is a rank 4 Brymore ore with an attack plus 60. Let's craft both accessories. Now that we have these, let's switch to Enhance Accessory. We will enhance the Fodder Accessory first and cap its level. Now we switch to Transfer Skill. First, select the main accessory you want the skill to be transferred to. Then we select the Warrior Emblem we level, and it will ask which skill we want to transfer. You already know the answer. Pick which slot you want the new skill to go on, and that is all. Repeat this three more times. Now let me explain a few rules about how this works. You can take a skill from any ore type. I did not have to use two warrior emblems. To take a skill from an accessory, its level must be capped. If it is a rank 5 accessory, it must be level 5 for you to take any skill and transfer it, no matter what slot you want to take a skill from. If it is a rank 2 accessory, it only needs to be level 2, since that is the highest level that accessory can reach. So you can save resources by using lower level ores, but do not forget what I said before. Certain skills are only available in certain slots. Cooking! Cook food for various timed boosts for the party. Visit a campfire or visit an inn. Resting at campfires and inns also replenishes all HP and CP. L1 and R1 let you filter which types of recipes are in the list. We have the ingredients list, how long the dish lasts for, picture with the description, the effect of the food, and favorite meal effect. The favorite meal effect is straightforward. For leaf-wrapped fish, if Kisara cooks the dish, the time the buff lasts for goes up by 20%. Each character has their own cooking effect, but is only available for certain foods. There are recipes that increase EXP, gain from combat, elemental defense, increase ore obtained from gathering, and many more. Oh, and there are tiers to these food buffs. Leaf Wrapped Fish has a T in its cooking effect. The order is T, S, M, L. The latter ones having a stronger effect. The game does not state what these letters stand for, so I decided on my own words. Tiny, small, medium, large. There can only be one active food buff at a time. Ingredients are scattered around the world and in stores for purchase. When a new item is gathered for the first time, there is this kneeling animation. There is also a farming mechanic for you to obtain meats. Recipes can be found in chests or via side quests. 
There's also this symbol under the minimap that indicates how long your food buff lasts for. Once this symbol disappears, your food buff has ended and you will be reminded to eat again with some voice lines. I just realized I never mentioned how to flee combat. But who wants to flee? That's not the point of this video. We're here to learn combat. We want as much experience as possible. I'm sure you already noticed the flee button in the menu during combat. Go press it if you really need it. There are a few details to its use. Once flee is selected, escape with a white bar underneath appears in the center of the screen. Once the bar fully shrinks, you run away from combat. Nothing will interrupt this escape bar. The enemy you run away from will also leave the field, so no need to worry about them chasing you down. But do not believe you can run away from every enemy in the game, like this guy. If you're defeated in combat, CP is spent to revive and heal your characters. If that can't be done, you get revived anyway. Characters will just revive with 1 HP. But if you really want to leave combat, just press the start button and load a save. Autosaves and Tales of Arise are impeccable, so you can return to the title screen and load up the autosave. Be on the lookout for these giant enemies though. Defeating them increases your max CP. You can always cancel your flee if you reopen the menu and select flee again. You can be a maniac like me and constantly switch your active character to get more from combat, but if you want to stick to one and let the AI handle the rest, here you go. Open the menu and select strategy. Here you can set up to four commands for your AI party mates. Here we go, rapid fire. Fight with moderation, no items, focus on healing, fight aggressively, save CP, don't spend CP, go all out against bosses, healing only, don't do anything. The red flag indicates which tactic you will start combat with. Press square on a different tactic to switch it. Press triangle for change tactics details. You can select conditions, items, and limits to set to your tactics. Each tactic has its own base set of parameters and priority is given to the topmost options. In the combat menu on the bottom left, you can press triangle to cycle through the four tactics you set in the strategy menu. Note in your next battle, it will start with whichever tactic you set your flag to, and not the tactic you ended that combat encounter on. There is one more method of AI control we have access to. Go to the party edit screen, here, battle control. There are three options, semi-auto, auto, and manual. Let's start with semi-auto. This is the default when you start the game. When your active character is set to semi-auto and you press a button for an attack, the character will automatically move with an appropriate range for that attack. Even if you move the stick in a different direction when you perform the action, the character will still attack in the direction of the targeted enemy. Semi-auto holds back the efficacy of some arts, unfortunately. An example is Shion's hold version of Luke Celestra. Here it is with semi-auto. The attack homes in on the enemy, yet Shion runs up to it before starting the attack. This happens because the game is moving her in range of the regular grenade throw version, and once the grenade is thrown, the game notices the player is actually holding the button for the hold version of the attack. Here it is on manual. A noticeable difference. Manual gives you full control. If you want to basic attack in a different direction from your currently targeted enemy, you can. If you want to throw a shield grenade in a different direction, you can. Just hold the direction you want the attack to go in. Spells that are cast will always be placed on the currently targeted enemy. Manual also acts as semi-auto. If you hold no direction when using a projectile, it will auto-target to the currently selected enemy, but will not move you within attack range. Auto is for those who do not want to be active in combat. The game will fight enemies all on its own, with no intervention from you. Having said that, if you want the game to play itself, why are you watching this video? Know what? I'm not going to judge. Auto is also the mode any character you are not controlling will default to, and there are a few differences in the auto mode for each character. While in auto, Alfin will primarily target enemies with lower HP, Shion will primarily target flying and spell wielding enemies, and enemies with lower HP, Rinwo will target enemies with lower HP, Law will target enemies with lower HP, Kisar will prioritize enemies attacking party members with lower HP, and higher level enemies, Dohalim will prioritize flying enemies and higher level enemies. I almost forgot to go back over this. Do you remember the L2 R2 thing from the arts window? This art list gives you control over which arts the AI controlled characters are allowed to use. This is best if you think an art sucks or if the AI keeps using the wrong elemental attacks on enemies for example. The mystic arts can even be turned off if you'd like. As a reminder, there are spreadsheets in the video description for all arts, skill panels, Renwell's spell storage combinations, accessory ores, and arts damage calculations. Not all information was compiled by me, so links of original sources will be available. Now, now do you understand Tales of Rise combat and mechanics?
I hope you learned something new, got the information you were seeking, or just enjoyed hearing me speak of an RPG I had fun playing. In the comments, let me know of your experience with Tales of Arise, and if this explanation was helpful. Until next time.